Hello. It has recently come to my attention that there are people in this country who have not heard of the Donner Party. This has prompted me to make up a quick history lesson for my theater and history class. And for those people too lazy to go to the Wikipedia page. During the 1840s, the United States saw a dramatic increase in pioneers, people who left their homes in the East to settle in Oregon and California, inspired by the idea of Manifest Destiny, a philosophy that asserted the land between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans belonged to Americans and that they should settle it. Most wagon trains followed the Oregon Trail, a route from Independence, Missouri to the Continental Divide, on a journey that usually took between four and six months. An early immigrant named Lanford W. Hastings had gone to California in 1842 and saw the promise of the undeveloped country. To entice settlers, he published a guide for pioneers titled The Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. He described a direct route across the Great Basin, which would bring immigrants through the Wasatch Mountains and across the Great Salt Lake Desert, which would soon be called the Hastings Cutoff, a quote-unquote shortcut which would soon fuck over our new friends, the Donner Party. In the spring of 1846, almost 500 wagons heading west from Independence. At the rear of the train, a group of nine wagons containing 32 members of the Reed and Donner families and their employees left Independence on May 12th. Several other families joined the wagon train along the way, eventually building the party's members to somewhere around 87. On July 31st, 1846, the party left Black Forks along the Hastings Cutoff. Within days, they found the terrain much more difficult than described. The Oregon Trail had left an easy and obvious path to follow, whereas the Cutoff was much more difficult to find. The group had to decide whether to turn back and rejoin the traditional trail or continue along the cutoff. At James Reed's urging, the party chose to go along the Hastings route. They reached the Great Salt Lake on August 20th. The party came across a torn and tattered letter from Hastings. The pieces indicated that there were two days and nights of difficult travel without grass or water ahead. Having no alternative, the party pressed on, only to find that the wheels of their wagons sank into the salt. The days were blistering hot and the nights frigid cold. Some of the animals were so weakened that they were left yoked to their wagons and abandoned. Nine of Reed's ten oxen had broken away and run loose in the desert. Many other families' cattle and horses had also gone missing. The rigors of the journey had resulted in irreparable damage to some of the wagons, but no human lives had been lost. The journey across the Great Salt Lake Desert took six days. James Reed had suggested that two men go ahead to Sutter's Fort in California for extra provisions. Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon had volunteered to undertake the dangerous trip. On September 26, two months after embarking on the cutoff, the Donner Party rejoined the traditional trail along a stream that became known as the Humboldt River. The shortcut had probably delayed them by at least a month. By now, everyone was pretty much pissed at one another, and tensions rose. After a dispute, James Reed stabbed John Snyder in the neck and killed him. Reed was banished. The trials the Donner Party had so far endured resulted in splintered groups, each looking out for themselves and distrustful of others. Stanton, one of the two-man party who had left a month earlier to seek assistance in California, found the company and brought mules, food, and two Consum Indians, Lewis and Salvador. He also brought news that Reed, although haggard and starving, had succeeded in reaching Sutter's Fort. The party reached Truckee Lake in the Sierra Mountains, and due to snow beginning to fall, they settled in cabins that had been built before by other travelers. Reed attempted a rescue with McCutcheon from Sutter's Fort, but the snow-covered mountains forced them to abandon the rescue. By now, the party was on the edge of desperation. Food was all but gone, and desperate times called for desperate measures. A party of 17 men, women, and children set out on foot in an attempt to cross the mountain pass, called the Snowshoe Party or the Forlorn Hope. 
The members of the party were neither well nourished nor accustomed to camping in snow twelve feet deep, and by the third day most were snow blind. The group became lost and confused. On January 12th, the group stumbled into a Miwok camp looking so deteriorated that the Indians initially fled at the sight of them. The Miwoks gave what food that they could. After a few days, William Eddy continued on with help of a Miwok guide to a ranch in a small farming community at the edge of the Sacramento Valley. A hurriedly assembled rescue party found the other six survivors on January 17th. Their journey from Truckee Lake had taken 33 days. A rescue party including William Eddy, Reed, and McCutcheon started on February 4th from the Sacramento Valley. On February 18th, the seven-man rescue party scaled the Fremont Pass. As they neared where Eddie told them where the cabins would be, they began to shout. A member of the donor party appeared from a hole in the snow. All of the cabins had been buried underneath the snowfall. Twenty-three people were chosen to go with the rescue party, leaving seventeen in the cabins at Truckee Lake and twelve at Alder Creek. On March 1st, a second relief party arrived from Truckee Lake. Patrick Breen documented a disturbing visit in the last week of February from Mrs. Murphy, who said that her family was considering eating Milt Elliot. Elliot's body was found mutilated, according to historian George Stewart. The older camp fared no better. The first two members of the relief party to reach it saw someone carrying a human leg. When Reed and McCutcheon made their presence known, the party member threw it into a hole in the snow that contained the mostly dismembered body of Jacob Donner. Inside the tent, Elizabeth Donner refused to eat, although her children were being nourished by the organs of their father, according to historian Ethan Rarick. The rescuers discovered that three other bodies had already been consumed. The second relief party evacuated 17 immigrants only three of whom were adults, from Truckee Lake. On March 14th, five more were rescued. The last relief party, more of a scavenger team than a rescue party, left on April 10th. Louis Kiesberg was the only one left alive, and according to diary excerpts, among human remains. Of the 87 people who entered the Wasatch Mountains, 48 survived. Only the Reed and Breen families remained intact. Most of the survivors were able to rebuild their lives. An 1847 story printed in the California Star described Kiesberg's near lynching by the salvage party and his actions in ghoulish terms, reporting that he preferred to eat human flesh to the cattle and horses that had become exposed in the spring thaw. Kiesberg brought a defamation shoot against several members of the relief party who accused him of murdering Tamson Donner. The court awarded in his favor one dollar in damages. This is but a brief history of the Donner Party and I overlook many details. I encourage each of you to do your own research and discover what you can about the Donner Party. As always, the best place to start is your local library. Thank you and have a nice day.